Welcome, I'm Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number four, Ontologies as Key to Knowledge Representation. In this section of the lecture we are talking about the crucial role of mathematical logic, especially if you want to talk about ontologies. So first of all, what we did so far was based on RDFS and I'm going to show you now first why RDFS is not sufficient for our purposes. So let's assume the following example. So let's have a look here. I will switch on my laser pointer. You see here we have a class animal and we have the property eats. An animal eats food. That's clear. Simple as that. And as food, we can, of course, distinguish between vegetables, that's a subclass of food, and as well, meat, that's also a subclass of food. So now, how do we denote that a cow, of course, only eats vegetables and no meat, and other animals only eat meat, and some are eating both? So if we here simply denote that cow is an animal, it's not clear that the cow only eats vegetables, so we can't do that. So this is called locality of global properties and this is a thing that is crucial and not possible with doing it in RDFS. But it's not, not the only thing. You might remember already disjunct disjunctiveness. So for example, vegetables and meats, of course, these classes are disjunctive because uh, meat is never uh, some, let's say, item of meat is never, of course, also then member of the set of vegetables. So this is usually not uh, the case. And the RDFS subclass relation cannot express disjunctive class or subclass memberships. So disjunctive classes is also a thing we can't do. Another thing would be define a class by the combination of other classes and say then that the new class contains only members from the given classes and nothing else. So these kind of class combinations and enumerations are not possible in RDFS. Cardinality constraints. So we know every human usually has two parents. So this is a number constriction or a, a constraint. So although it might be not necessarily two, so somebody might have more parents, then exactly this cannot be expressed with a diagram you see here. We only can say that parent, of course, is a subclass of human and every human has a parent who is a parent. But how many these are, we can't tell. And there are, of course, other special property constraints which are rather important. For example, transitivity, like in the case if you have a property that expresses is greater than. If A is greater than B and B is greater than C, it automatically follows that also A is greater than C. So transitivity, we can't express. The other thing is uniqueness. Is mother of? Usually you only have one mother, of course. And this is unique, so functional in that sense. And uh, this, of course, we also cannot constrain here. So in RDFS, we could define that you have several mothers and, of course, that wouldn't be any inconsistency. Inversibility. So some properties might be the inverse of another property, like, for example, compare is parent of and is child of. So they are inverse to each other. And we m need means to express exactly that. The base problem that we have in RDFS is that RDFS does not have or give us the possibility to negate something. If I would define here, for example, that Harald is of type vegetarian, and in the next sentence or next triple, Harald is of type non-vegetarian, yeah, that would not generate a contradiction because we cannot really say, A, what's a vegetarian and a non-vegetarian here, and we cannot come to a negation or a contradiction that these two things are somehow the negation of the other one the complement of the other one. So that's not possible. And since we cannot automatically generate contradictions, all of the other things also are not possible. So we need something more. And what we need here for our formal specification in the ontology definition, you might remember an ontology is an explicit formal specification of a shared conceptualization. We need formal machine readable, machine understandable semantics and this can only be guaranteed if this is based on mathematical logic. And therefore, mathematical logic is really important for our uh, endeavor. Okay, let's have a look, a closer look at logic. So what are the foundations of logic? So for our lecture, 
we stay with the definition that logic is the study of how to make correct formal deductions and inferences. And why do we call that formal logic? Yeah, we want to enable automation, so this is the thing we want to do. So it should be computable on our machines here on a computer. And this, of course, then dates back, or this idea, this general assumption dates back to um, Leibniz. And this is, of course, not the real Leibniz. This is how uh, Artbot, that's one of these nice generative AI tools, imagines uh, Leibniz. And he once wrote here in 1687 in a letter to, to Philip John Spanner uh, the following thing. So hear that. The only way to rectify our reasonings is to make them as tangible as those of the mathematicians, so that we can find our error at a glance. And when there are disputes among persons, we can simply say, let us calculate, without further ado, to see who is right. And exactly this is what we want to do, or try to achieve also based on formal mathematical logics. OK, logics, what, have we, what do we have to deal with there? First, we have syntax. Syntax, of course, is only symbols without meaning in that sense. We define rules how to, to construct well-formed and valid se sequences of symbols here. So this is defined in the syntax of logic. More important for us is then also the semantics, because the syntax has been, or needs meaning, so that's the meaning of the syntax. And semantics there defines rules about how the meaning of complex sequences of symbols can be derived from atomic sequences of symbols, because there we define explicitly what the semantic is. However, there are different forms of semantics, and we will be looking on that. So if you have, let's say, a, a piece of program code, as we have here, so that's clearly, so if i is uh, smaller than or less than zero, then display negative account. Which means, so the assignment of meaning would be, yeah, what does this statement mean? Print the message negative account if the account balance is negative. Quite clear. So this is kind of the meaning that we want to impose here. However, why should I care about semantics? Let's ask our friend Bertrand Russell, famous philosopher and mathematician, as well as logician. So he would say, well, from a philosophical point of view, we need to specify the relationship between statements in the logic and the existential phenomena they describe. And this is what semantics is for in logic. Yeah, you might say, that's OK, but I don't get paid for philosophy. Yeah. Ah, Russell would answer from a practical point of view. In order to specify, build, and test ontology-based tools or systems, we need to precisely define relationships, like entailment, between logical statements and this defines the intended behavior of our tools and systems. Great. OK, so I'm going to need semantics. So let's have a look at the variants of semantics on our example of programming languages. So what you see here is some program code that does the computation of a factorial. And the intended semantics or intentional semantics would be the meaning as intended by the user, which restricts the set of all possible models, in that case meanings, to the meaning that has been intended by the human user, which means the computation of the factorial. However, there are more semantics. So there is a formal semantics, which means here you can, of course, write down the formula for the factorial. And the formal semantics here aims to express the meaning of symbol sequences, which means programs, in a formal language. So in a way that assertions over the symbol sequences which are programs, can be proven by the application of deduction rules. Quite clear. And another semantics, so we have the procedural semantics, which is the be behavior of the program at execution time. So procedural semantics is the meaning of language expression. The program is the procedure that takes place internally whenever the expression does occur. So these are different variants of semantics, and there is, of course, another one. So, however, we want to define semantics of a mathematical logic. How do we do that? Let's ask our friend Bertrand Russell again. He would say, in mathematical logic, we define the semantics in terms of so-called models. So it's a model theory. We are doing model theoretic semantics. A model 
is supposed to be an analog part or an analog of a part of the world that is being modeled. Okay, as easy as that. The guy we are referring to here is Alfred Tarski, also famous logician and mathematician, and he defined model theoretic semantics. And this model theoretic semantics performs the semantic interpretation of artificial and natural languages by simply identifying meaning with an exact and formally defined interpretation based on a model. So we do a formal interpretation with a model. So simple example, let's look at the model theoretic semantics of propositional logic, the most simplest form of logic here. And there we do it by the assignment of truth values, true or false, to atomic assertions. And then there are logical connectives and or implication and so on. And we can describe them simply, these logical connectives, based on truth tables. And this would our model that we are using here. And in that sense, it serves as an interpretation because it tells us which of these statements is under which conditions true or false. So that's a kind of model theoretic semantics we are dealing with. Okay, let's get down and do this a bit in a more formal way. Any logic L consists usually first of a set of statements. So that's that one, that's S. And then this fancy symbol, this is the so-called entailment relation, which tells you how to deduce something or infer something or entail something, as the name says. Okay, how does that work? How is that defined? Okay, let's see here we have phi, which is a subset of S of all of our statements. So this is capital phi. And then we have a single statement, it's of course then a lowercase phi, that's a single element of S. And you can say that here um, the lowercase phi is a logical consequence of the uppercase phi. Or from the assertions of the, upper, uh, the, the yeah, uppercase phi um, follows the assertion lowercase phi. Next time probably I should choose other variables. However, we stay with that. So it should be clear then here that you define what exactly is a logical consequence. What we also need, that this makes sense, we have to say when two logical assertions, here we have phi and psi, both elements of S, when they are the same. And they are the same if, if one can be entailed from the other. So we write this here, so then here phi is um, from the assertion phi, it follows the assertion psi, and the other way around, so phi can also be entailed as a logical consequence of psi. See here, uh, or note here, that of course on this end of the entailment relation there is always a set of assumptions. So therefore only this uh, single assertion that we have here has to be embraced here in curly brackets. Okay, if this is the case, so if one can really be derived or is a logical consequence of the other and vice versa, then both assertions, phi and psi, are logically equivalent. So this is this symbol here. And with these two things you can explain already the logical or let's say the, the model theoretic semantics of a mathematical logic. And of course I see now we have to go a bit deeper into logics itself. So follow me to excursion number five, where we do a recap of essential logics in a nutshell.